Welcome to the Climate Diplomacy Podcast, a podcast from the Berlin-based Think and Do Tank Adelphi, bringing you the latest insights and debates in international climate diplomacy and security. We are your hosts, Raquel Monayer. And I'm Alexandra Steinkraus. In this series, you will hear from experts and practitioners offering their take on climate foreign policy, climate-related impacts to security, and promoting peace and resilience in a changing climate. For more information, please visit climate-diplomacy.org or follow at Climate Diplo on Twitter. Welcome, everyone, to the first episode of 2023. We hope you had a good holiday season and had some time to recharge and reflect. And for those of you who don't celebrate it this time of the year, hopefully you could get some work done as you got a well-deserved break from the rest of us. And here at the Climate Diplo podcast, we are looking at the new year as a time to look forward to new opportunities for promoting peace and resilience in a changing climate. And we can't think of anyone better to have this talk with than our heads of program for climate diplomacy and security, Janani Vivekananda and Benjamin Pohl. So they've been following the podcast closely from the beginning, of course. They have given us orientation and also inspiration throughout this time. And we are very happy to finally have a chat with you in our metaphorical fireplace. So a warm welcome. Welcome to you both. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Hi, Alex. Hi, Raquel. Thanks for having us. So before we take a look to the future, let's briefly look to the past before we get started. What are both of your personal climate, peace, and security highlights from 2022? So maybe if I start, I think before we look at the highlights, I think it's worth acknowledging that 2022 was a difficult year, both with a view to the environmental and climate disasters we witnessed, the floods in Pakistan, and the trials in the Horn of Africa, and also in other parts of the world, and of course, with a view to violent conflicts in many parts of the world, but for us in Germany, of course, most palpably in terms of Russia's full-on invasion of Ukraine, which not only had percussions for Ukrainians, but has also fueled food price rises in many parts of the world, and again, with terrible consequences. And I think uh, what this just shows in terms of the climate, peace and security agenda is how both environmental crisis wars interact and reinforce bad outcomes without there necessarily having to be a direct causal link. It's just that both the droughts and the production shortfalls that they resulted in and then the impacts of the war mutually reinforced each other and led to these food price rises and food insecurity. So this being said, it being a difficult year also in terms of the geopolitics, of course, I think there was progress in some areas and notably, of course, there was a climate COP in Egypt, which had included one important step forward with loss and damage, making one step forward soon being implemented and thus facilitating anticipatory action. And I think that's important because in many ways, the climate negotiations so far had been fairly focused on mitigation, which of course is critical for our longer term future, but at the same time was perceived to have come a little bit at the expense of the adaptation agenda, which is critically important to many countries in the global south, which are already affected to a large extent, which are already feeling these losses and damages. So I think what we have been witnessing, maybe primarily in incremental rather than revolutionary steps is this climate peace and security agenda becoming more mainstream at the COP, across the UN, and of course, in many regional organizations. And just to add maybe a German perspective, Germany is now working on its very first national security strategy. And while this takes place against the backdrop of the Russian invasion and the related need to reassess German foreign and security policy, our foreign minister has announced and made clear that broader human security considerations and the impacts of global environmental change on both human and national and international security that they need to feature prominently. So again, I think a good sign progress in mainstreaming the interactions between environmental and conflict risks. Cool. Thanks, Ben. I think my highlight was somewhat linked to this. It was the launch of the Climate, Environment, Peace and Security Declaration, first through the G7's joint statement on this in May 2022 at the G7 summit, and then officially at the Berlin Climate Security Conference in October with about 20 states endorsing the position and many other states and institutions showing their support. So 
personally, I'm really proud of this because it was a lot of time in the making and took quite a bit of working behind the scenes to get a common position. Now, it's essentially a declaration. It's a piece of paper. So why am I so excited about this? It's essentially words rather than actions. But I am because I think we really can't move forward towards joint action whilst we're still stumbling around over what different people or different institutions understand by the terminology around climate change, peace and security and what the challenge actually entails on the ground and also what the kind of common guiding principles are for action, even as it takes very different shapes across different contexts by different actors. So what actually is this declaration? So this declaration, the Climate, Environment, Peace and Security Declaration, is an incredibly important milestone. It's basically for the first time something that sets out a common language and a seven-point shared agenda for action for all those wishing to work at this critical interface that Bendis laid out on this coming together of climate, peace, resilience, environment, and conflict. It, for example, broadens the frame of how some actors have previously considered climate security to include environment and biodiversity loss. I was really pleased about this because it's find the division between climate impacts and responses and other environmental impacts and responses to peace, pretty unhelpful and limiting. So I think it's really important to look at these in the round. And also important in this declaration is the explicit inclusion of gender equality, which for all of us working on this topic on sustainable peace and resilience, it of course should be a given, but it's not often. So it's really important to have this declaration, which underlines it in text to remind us to all that climate, peace, security and gender, it's not an either or issue, but an and issue that they're mutually reinforcing. So having this agenda for action means that whilst action can take different forms in different contexts, it can all fall under this broad umbrella and we can ensure that our collective efforts are working towards the same goal so that we don't inadvertently undermine other efforts And ultimately, the hope is that if we can pursue this agenda for action, the individual efforts can be greater than the sum of their parts. So the Berlin Climate and Security Conference was also one of my big highlights from this year. Of course, in addition to hosting this podcast, and as you've rightfully highlighted, this Climate for Peace initiative was one of the biggest highlights and a big thing for the community moving forward. As we move from declaration to initiative, what can we expect to see in the year ahead? So the Climate for Peace initiative came out of this Climate, Environment, Peace and Security Declaration. It's essentially the operational arm of the declaration. It's almost a product of our own success. We're now at a stage where policymakers are sitting up and listening to these risks that climate change poses to peace and security. And we're seeing an increasing number of activities and actors at policy and program level working on this issue all over the place. But to avoid too much fragmentation and duplication, so that the loss of coordination, we do need to find a way to connect the community of practice. So the goal of the Climate for Peace initiative is to act as this umbrella to coordinate and advance projects which tackle climate, peace and security risks on the ground. It's essentially a really important venture to promote and steward this agenda for action laid out in the declaration. It calls for such things as requirements for action. So ensuring that we can promote adequate climate adaptation financing, getting into fragile states. It's asking actors to ensure that they firmly integrate climate change data into conflict analysis to enable climate risk-informed peace building and stabilization work on the conflict side. And then on the climate action side, it also calls for promoting conflict sensitivity across all dimensions of climate action, be that adaptation, financing, mitigation, or loss and damage. So this initiative, it was launched at the Berlin Climate Security Conference. And at the end of last year and this year, I expect to see a growing base of support as the initiative moves to a more action-driven phase. We're also going to see a secretariat being put in place and online we'll soon be able to see a roll call of projects and processes happening under this initiative, which contribute to the agenda for action on climate, environment, peace and security. And the idea here is to help to increase coordination, to showcase the good practice, enable sharing and partnerships across donors and communities that are affected by these risks, and also identify gaps and needs to ensure that further action is informed by these needs and that we can replicate the good stuff and we don't repeat the bad stuff and that we can actually use some of the good intentions on the donor side to plug the gaps rather than doubling up on things that are already being done. 
I think where is the first question very much reflected on the progress we've made in terms of narratives. I think what is maybe even more important about 2022 is how there's also been a progress actually on the implementation front. And so maybe in circling back to question on the highlights, I think one of the highlights certainly was for me that we get the weathering risk the peace pillar started. So we now have three well-known mediation organizations, the Back Foundation, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue and the European Institute of Peace designing peacemaking projects that systematically build on environmental peacebuilding efforts with the aim not just of doing these specific projects in different parts of the world, which are very important, but also to learn from this in a systematic fashion so that this can then be taken up elsewhere so that we complement the progress we are making in terms of awareness of the peace and stability risks of environmental change with progress in terms of actually building peace on the ground. Yeah, it's great to hear the word action coming up so much because this does seem to represent a crucial moment for climate policy, for the climate community. As in, there's much less convincing work needing to be done at this point, And we're getting much more interested into the practical questions of how to make things work. And as we were speaking of BCSC as one of our main highlights, 2022 was the first year in which we could have a full in-person iteration since our first edition back in 2019. So I guess the question is, is there one thing that sticks out to you as a topic or a theme that you're most excited to include in our next iteration in 2023? Yeah, BCSE was a real highlight. It was so invigorating to connect with so many people in person after so many months of remote working. One thing, oh gosh, if I'm allowed to, I'd say the biggest breakthrough I think for 2022 was the acknowledgement of loss and damage at COP27. And for those of us working on climate peace and security, it's really clear that the gains made on loss and damage especially around anticipatory action, getting ahead of those losses and damages and preventing losses. These gains have huge potential to reduce climate-related security risks because the drivers of vulnerability to loss and damage matters are the same as those that drive climate-related security risks. These are things like weak governance and poverty and exclusion. But there's really little connection made between these two communities, both intellectually and on the policy side. So I think this would be a real hot topic that I'd like to see BCSE look at, how to make those connections so that any advances on loss and damage can also contribute to building sustainable peace in the changing climate. And also for 2023's BCSE, I would like us to critically explore critical minerals. We've seen a huge movement in renewable technology, but I think the pace of this change, it's been amazing to see this kind of catalytical impact on the back of the energy crisis, which is something of a silver lining. But that pace of change has meant that the peace and security implications of the move to green energy have been relatively underexplored. And there is a dark side to the renewable progress such as the ungoverned mining of critical minerals like lithium, which can fuel rent-seeking behavior, and war economies in already fragile contexts like the DRC. So we need to better understand these peace and security implications around that will accompany this green transition so that we can circumvent them. So I'd be really excited to see BCSE 2023, including cutting-edge thinking on peace-positive green transition. Oh, and one other thing. I'm also really excited to see BCSC maybe moving out of Berlin for the first time this year. So we have a possibility, fingers crossed, to have our first ever BCSC out of Berlin, maybe in Nairobi to ensure a truly global conversation. So I'm super excited about that. Nairobi sounds very exciting. I'm also looking forward to this one. Hopefully it will work out. Yeah, in our last podcast episode, right before the new year, we spoke with a new member of the Climate Security Expert Network, Hafsama Alim. And our conversation revolved around the evolution of climate peace and security discussion in the UN Security Council. Now, as in every January, we have now five new non-permanent members sitting at the council. This year we have Mozambique, we have Japan, Ecuador, Malta, and Switzerland joining the group of 15. And we also have the United Arab Emirates, which is good to mention because they will be hosting COP28 in the end of this year. So what do you hope to see in the coming year coming from the Security Council? Unfortunately, in the last year, the climate, peace and security discussions in the UN Security Council have become fairly stuck after Russia vetoed the draft thematic resolution on the peace and security impacts of climate change back in December 2021. And we have to say that draft resolution was not very ambitious because of the known divisions on the Council. 
essentially it was vetoed not on the substance of what it proposed, but on symbolic politics. And so that means that the Security Council is not in the greatest position to push forward a lot. But against that unpromising backdrop, I think the agenda has held up fairly well last year in terms of being mainstreamed across the UN system and being put into the mandates of various UN operations. And I would hope that we see this being continued in 2023 and possibly even expanded because all the newly elected members to the Security Council are very supportive of the climate security agenda. And one particularly critical member state has left the council and another one has seen important domestic changes. This doesn't change the fact that there continue to be divisions, but I think overall the composition of the Security Council is friendlier towards making progress on climate security linkages. So I hope for a way forward that is substantively an an issue-led, where the operations are tasked by the council to assess and then, where appropriate, act on climate fragility risks. But I also believe that the role of the UN Security Council should not be overstated because the value of the Security Council mandating operations to act on climate fragility risks is primarily in creating awareness and voicing expectations and so giving a space to work on this. But most operations could probably also deduce this from other parts of their mandate, which are about sustaining and building peace, as long as they are aware of and perceive risks from the interlinkages between environmental change and security. And here I'm fairly optimistic that they will see this irrespective of the exact language in the mandate because of the bottom-up awareness and the interest, which I think is growing a lot. And we see this in the trainings and workshops that we do with the UN, with regional organizations and with diplomats and practitioners from around the world. So I think we are now at a point where this assessment is coming bottom up. So there is also less of a need to put this symbolic signal of a UN Security Council language out there. I'd add to that that whilst it wasn't a success, the draft resolution in Ireland at the end of last year wasn't a total dead loss. It wasn't passed, but it was co-sponsored by 113 member states. And I think that really shows something about the legitimacy of this issue now, which is going to make it much harder to ignore. But also beyond a push to pass a resolution on climate security or get climate security wording into UN mission mandates, I think it's also really important when it comes to thinking about what the Security Council can do to recognize that climate security needs to be properly resourced. So even if we get language within resolutions or mandates, It needs to be resourced so that these words can actually be translated to action, that we can actually see something being implemented. So I think that's really core to underline. And maybe looking beyond the UN Security Council, but staying in New York, if we look at the UN more broadly, I think there's also real scope looking forward into next year to make even more use of the UN Group of Friends on Climate Change and Security. I think the new co-chairs of the group of friends would do really well to have a clear, inclusive and strategic work plan with a goal. And I think one of these goals, as Ben mentioned, is of shifting the climate security narrative. One point here I think that's really important is to broaden the geographic aperture. I think so far the focus has overlooked certain regions of the world affected by climate security risks. There's been such an Africa-centric focus of climate security research and dialogue, particularly in New York, that certain countries and in certain regions, namely Latin America, South Asia and Central Asia, haven't really been that engaged in the group of friends. And they feel somewhat inhibited because they can't really see how the narratives around climate security, such as climate-induced farmer herder conflicts, actually relate to them. So countries like Bangladesh or Haiti, they're holding back because they think these aren't our issues. So what are we meant to do about this? So I think it's really important to have a more inclusive geographically or evidence-based discourse on climate security to ensure that there really is a global buy-in to this. And I think the Group of Friends is a great vehicle for this. And we're, of course, not the only people taking stock and looking ahead to the new year. At the end of 2022, the International Rescue Committee put out its emergency watch list for 2023, which also underscored the fact that climate change is rapidly accelerating humanitarian emergencies and its impacts in countries like South Sudan, Ethiopia, Somalia, and Yemen. And of course, many of these emergencies exacerbated by the invasion of Ukraine. 
which you pointed out earlier, Ben. So as the year moves forward, what key developments or geographical areas or drivers are you keeping a close eye on? From all I read, I think the global humanitarian outlook is very worrying, and there are numerous countries where we have to fear that it will get worse from the Horn of Africa, you mentioned, Alex, to parts of Western Asia, such as Yemen and beyond. We cannot necessarily foresee because there is interaction effects of, let's say, a food price shock that might pop up somewhere totally different from where the effect on production may be happening. So there is a threat to our global system becoming overwhelmed, which would just mean probably tolerating greater suffering for the simple reason of the limitation of means. So the resource needs are increasing, but I'm not sure where a commented rise in response will come from. So there's a risk that there isn't done enough on the humanitarian front, and that should be an important focus for next year. But there's also a secondary risk that a strong focus on just the humanitarian life-saving and the tremendous needs that it would crowd out a more forward-looking and anticipatory action, again, because of the limited means. But doing that would be terrible in the long run because we have to be prepared for crisis to get worse. We know that the impacts of climate change are going to get worse over the coming years. So our current response system is insufficient and we need to improve structures at the same time as we are fighting the fires of the day. And so I think that's a big task ahead to pursue these two tracks in parallel, drawing up a commensurate response to the humanitarian needs of the near future by building the system that will prevent the even bigger needs for the years down the line. Thanks for that cheerful outlook, Pan. That's really depressing. Yeah, no, I can't deny that 2023 is not looking good. We've got these cascading risks of the global poly crises which hit us over the past years, the war in Ukraine, food and energy price shocks, the debt crisis, the geopolitical upheavals, and these aren't going anywhere and they're going to continue to compound. And yes, as you say, Ben, we're going to see as a result humanitarian need continuing to rise. And at the same time, domestic needs in donor countries are going to really put a squeeze on what we see in terms of development assistance and humanitarian aid. So I think we need to have a look at how we can do better with the existing and likely to be falling aid commitments. But to not be too negative, there are three areas I feel hopeful about. One is around food. The other is around biodiversity. And the third is on energy. So on food, our current food production system is responsible for a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions. We actually produce enough food to feed the world. And yet global hunger has never been higher. So it's really clear that the food system as it is needs to change. And I'm seeing movements here. I'm seeing this recognition increasing and looking ahead to 2023, I'll be looking out for step changes in the food system sector from agricultural production to storage and distribution to consumption patterns to see how food systems programming can be adapted and rejigged so that it can get better at doing no harm to climate security risks. So it doesn't contribute so much to climate emissions. It doesn't contribute to conflict risks. And it can actually contribute to reducing some of these risks in a proactive way. We're seeing changes in consumption patterns. We're actually seeing a lot more people thinking about their meat consumption. We're seeing large actors on the food front, such as the World Food Programme, really thinking about how they can better integrate conflict sensitivity and climate security risk-informed programming into their humanitarian food aid work. So I want to stay hopeful that this is going to be a catalytic year for conflict and climate-sensitive food programming. Biodiversity. So whilst COP27 on climate change was a bit of a mixed bag, one highlight and maybe source of hope was actually COP15 on biodiversity at the end of last year, which actually wasn't so negative. I think nearly 200 countries signed off on an international agreement to halt the loss of biodiversity. And this is really significant. So the links between biodiversity, nature-based solutions, climate resilience and peace are really strong, but they're under-researched and underrepresented in policy and programming. So I'll be looking out for more grounded research, which can feed into policy and practice to capitalize on these risks, which is actually something that's set out in the Climate, Environment, Peace and Security Declaration. So I'm feeling hopeful on that front. And the third point is around energy. We touched on this already. The energy crisis catalyzed by Russia's war in Ukraine has really turbocharged this growth in renewables. And we're seeing the EU and the US spearheading major policies to support renewable energy and energy efficiency. And there's a lot of financing around this as well. 
So I'll be watching to see how climate finance can support renewable energy solutions, which actively promote peace in the world's most fragile regions. So we're seeing that the links between energy poverty, climate vulnerability and conflict, if done well, can actually show peace dividends around renewable energy. And we see actors such as energy peace partners working to leverage climate finance for peace. And I think this is a hugely promising space for ensuring that both the major investments in green transition are conflict sensitive, that is, they don't inadvertently fuel grievances and conflicts, and that they're actively peace positive, that is, they can actively contribute to building social cohesion, building trust between communities and governments, and actually supporting basic services, which are like the prerequisites for peace. Looking forward, I think I'd be keeping an eye on these three areas that give us opportunities for double dividends to get more bang for our buck as we see our finances squeezed and needs growing. Maybe to add from my end, I think uh, I didn't want to be too negative. I think there's a lot of big trends going into the right direction in terms of technological development, in terms of economic developments, even in terms of a secular trend towards a greater solidarity as expressed not least by the progress on the question of loss and damage. So I think uh, while we are indeed faced with an increased impact of these cascading risks, there's also a lot more that we can do. And the last point that Jenny mentioned on energy is actually, it's such a success story because the growth of renewables has very strongly grown the more positive projections from just a few years ago. So it shows that once the political will and once the social capital is invested into the solution, then there actually is a lot of potential for progress. Especially if, as Jenny emphasized, you don't just look for the one techno fix but you embed it into a social context that makes it positive across a range of dimensions. So not just in the environmental domain, but making sure it's also conflict sensitive and peace positive. Oh man, you actually stole my one chance to be the positive good cop, Ben. We can cut it out. You can cut it out. And on a happy note. (laughs) You can cut out the last part. Well, I was just afraid. Good cop for one. <laughs> I was just afraid after you. Think, okay, maybe I was just being like, "God, what's going to hell?" <laughs> yeah. Edit it so that I sound more positive. Yeah. We'll just like <laughs> raid like thunder sounds thunder whenever sounds. Ben speaks, and like yeah. butterflies, like Rainbow. nature. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's the butterflies' wings the bird- that cause the tornado, right? Oh, the butterfly <laughs> effect. On the other end of the... This is the content that they were looking for. Right. Yeah, this That's is great. actually the content we are looking for. That's mm-hmm. great. But thanks for the questions. They were great. Sorry about the answers. They were great. Thanks. See what you can make of it, and then we might have to come back to the studio. Just edit in lots of bird song, and it'll be fine. 23 yeah. minutes of bird song. And we'll just take content. different interviews, and all of a sudden we'll have different volumes, clearly different conversations happening, and just the magic behind the scenes. But I do <laughs> feel the need to point out the fact that both of you got the second question wrong about highlights from this last year, because it's clearly karaoke after the BCS <laughs> that we are looking for. <laughs> yeah. But apparently, there's news that I hate karaoke going around. Wait, what? Who's spreading yeah, those these rumors? boys. The proof it's a lie. Why don't you do one song for the podcast? I will, but that's a standalone podcast. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Alec, so that could be your wrap up. If this was a song, what would it be? Oh my gosh, what a great question. If this podcast was a song, what song would it be? Oh, I've got one. Go. I can see clearly now the rain has gone. Really good. I thought Highway to Hell would be good. There's drought. There's drought. There's drought. Because of nature itself. ACDC. Not Stairway to Heaven. Not Stairway to Heaven. Not Stairway to Heaven. Thank you both for joining us for our first podcast of the new year. Looking back at 2022, the launch of the Climate for Peace initiative at BCSC and the establishment of the Loss and Damage Fund at COP were two of the biggest milestones to help guide and drive implementation and action in the climate peace and security field. Initiatives like Climate for Peace will establish baseline requirements and coordinate and advance projects so that way we can replicate what's good and what works and make sure efforts around the world don't replicate what doesn't work. And as the loss and damage fund is set up, we're looking to ensure conflict sensitivity is considered in its operationalization, since countries that are conflict affected also experience more loss and damage.
Looking forward, many of the challenges that were faced in 2022, like rising food prices and the impacts of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine, will also continue into this new year. But there is room for a positive outlook too. Food system reform and changing consumption patterns, progress towards a peace-positive green transition, and more grounded research on the linkages between biodiversity, nature, security, and peace are just some of the reasons for hope. I love that you mentioned COP15 in biodiversity. I think it's treated as a marginal topic, and it isn't. It is central to the climate conversation, so it was great to hear that. And this was the Climate Diplomacy Podcast. We will be back with another episode in a few weeks. Follow our latest updates on our Twitter channel at Climate Diplo. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, goodbye. Bye. Thank you for having us. Thank you.